traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you are doing very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional life, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. I want to take a minute and say welcome to all the new listeners and welcome back to veteran homestead love and regulars who stop by the farmcast every week. I appreciate you all so much. I am so excited to share with you what's going on at the farm this week. It's going to be a little more than usual. And we've made some really startling discoveries lately regarding the cost of milking cows. Or owning milk cows. And I want to share that with you today. Normandy versus Jersey. The cost is the main topic for today. Both are traditional breeds. Uh, What's the difference? And how does that affect the cost of of, uh, raising them, keeping them, managing them? All right. So we're going to have, I'm going to have some homestead life updates. Then I'll get into the main topic. And uh, today's recipe is a skillet chicken with nuchatel Spinach artichoke sauce. Nuftichel is uh, a, cheese, a cheese that originated in Normandy, France, you, and is traditionally made with uh, Normandy cow's milk. All right, let me talk about uh, homestead life updates. Okay, life is getting back to normal on the homestead. I'm healing nicely. I'm uh, mending, and my energy level is back to where I can work all day and not be too tired. Now, I still have to watch myself in the heat and doing too much in one day uh, because while I'm active all day, I want to be cognizant of the strength and energy required to perform certain activities. For instance, I might go to the garden for a little while, but not for the hours and hours I would put in before. You know, I do more inside tasks. Um, Speaking of the garden... Putting in less hours is working out well. The garden is actually winding down. Um, We finished with the tomatoes, and not because they weren't producing, but because I simply have had enough of tomatoes. (laughs) I planted way too many. If it weren't for the drought we've been experiencing, I would have had even more, and I would have been even more overwhelmed. Um, For most of the seasons, the tomatoes were small. And that was due to a lack of water and fertilizer, me not really having the time to uh, work with them, especially once I got sick. Um, They were very good tomatoes. They're just not very big. So instead of a nice, you know, three and a half inch diameter or larger, they were more like two and a half inches in diameter. Pretty small, I know. But uh, they were really, really good. And I've been preserving them in all kinds of different ways. I've canned and canned and canned, mostly tomato sauce. Um, Though I made a few jars of salsa, and I really like it. And I have all of the remaining tomatoes on a shelf inside the house near a window. We went out there, picked all the tomatoes off, even the small ones, the really small ones. And uh, I'm ripening all of those inside. And so the tomatoes will all, those tomatoes are all going to go into salsa. Um, currently, I have a batch of barbecue sauce uh, that is reducing right now. And it's just about ready to be canned. And uh, even though I'm using a traditional recipe, it calls for more sugar than I want. And I can leave out some of the sugar and start my own traditional barbecue sauce line as a much healthier product. That's one of the advantages of of, uh, making your own food. You get to decide what goes into it and how much. Let's talk about the animals. They're doing really well. We had, uh, Scott and I had a long discussion about where we are going to go with our animals. We currently have sheep, goats, cows, and donkeys. And 
which do we want to keep and which will go because we only have so much so many hours in the day. Um, we haven't talked much about the donkeys, though we have discussed selling two of them as we don't really need four. And after I talk about the sheep uh, later on, you'll see we may not really need any at all, any at all, but th that's another discussion. So let me talk about the sheep. Currently, we have one breeding ram and six ewes. And this year, that combination produced 10 lambs that will go to market next year. We also have three lambs that are ready for market right now. So get your orders in now if you want a half or a whole lamb. Again, there are only three. We had a good long discussion about the sheep a few days ago. Um, they are wonderful animals and they're very easy to keep and manage. And the flock has been genetically improved so that they have little to no problems with parasite. That was a big problem for us in the beginning. We lost a lot of animals, especially, especially small lambs in the first year or two to uh, parasites, worms, uh, basically worms. So our discussion around the animals really revolves around time management. And while sheep are easy to keep and to raise, they are also one more marketing task that we have to take on to sell the lambs and meat each year in our neck of the woods. Uh, lamb is actually quite popular. Uh, however, every minute I spend marketing lamb is a minute I don't spend marketing cheese. Uh, these are business decisions that have to be considered, even though the lamb is quite popular and it sells really well. I could be using that time to sell cheese or to make marketing materials for cheese and so on. You get that. In the end, we decided to phase out our flock of sheep. We will not breed this year and we will begin culling the older ewes a little at a time and... Uh, Likely we will sell the breeding ram, but in the end, all the sheep will be gone from our homestead, at least for the time being. Uh, we can revisit that after the creamery is completed and we have a good handle on making and marketing our cheese. But for right now, the creamery cheese making and the marketing that are our primary focus. Now let's talk about the goats. Unlike the sheep, the goats have a greater role to play in the maintenance of good pasture for our grass-fed operation. Uh, sheep do eat different things uh, than cows initially, but in the end, they both eat all of the grasses. So they'll eat their favorite stuff um, in the beginning, but eventually they just eat everything, both of them. But the goats, on the other hand, they like to eat woody stems such as small trees, briars, brambles, wild blackberries, and so on. Um, so they actually help maintain the pastures. But still, there's going to be changes, again, and it's relating to efficient time management on the homestead. We chose cashmere goats because I love to knit. So I should say, actually, I chose cashmere goats. Um, it was a great idea to raise them. We needed goats to maintain the pastures. And uh, I thought, well, I can comb out the cashmere, then send it off to be processed and spun into rovings and yarn. And uh, then I was going to knit cute little baby stuff to sell at the market, just kind of little value added things. And in the end, I simply don't have that kind of time. There's only so much I can do. Uh, this is a great life lesson. You can divide your focus between two things, but neither will ever get your full attention. So we have to make choices about what we will and will not do. I had a neighbor over just recently who has a spinning wheel she wanted me to come and get because I was going to, of course, learn how to spin my own yarn also. And she was going to do that. And she's had it for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years and, and never learned how to use it. And, and I told her, nope, I'm not going to do it either. I know I said I wanted it, but... We're really phasing out of that. I just don't have the time. Again, you can only do so many things. Um, now, the goats that we currently have, they require constant hoof maintenance. Um, and then you have the cashmere that has to be combed out at exactly the right time in late winter. Or it just ends up as, you know, $40 an ounce uh, fluff out there in the pasture just going to waste. 
And then there's uh, once you have the cashmere out, there's a pre-cleaning that happens before you you send it off to be professionally cleaned um, and carded and made into the rovings and, and yarn and so on. And um, I once thought that I would have lots of time in the winter to sit and do those kinds of tasks and knit to my heart's content. Uh, it didn't happen. I spend a great deal of time in the winter laying out the marketing plans for the spring, summer, and fall, learning more about marketing, redoing the website, you know, and so on, on and on and on. Because once spring has sprung, everything else goes on hold. Cows are being milked, cheese is being made, trips to the farmer's market are happening, and uh, a couple of times a week for that. And then, you know, I better have all of my marketing ducks in a row before the dam bursts. Um, I'm, it's, you know, doing the podcast, doing the newsletters, all of this stuff, it, it just really bursts like a dam bursting in, in the spring when it all happens at once. So back to the goats, what do we want to do with our goats? Um, we will still have a herd of goats. However, we are going to cull out all of the cashmere goats and eventually bring in some Kiko goats. Now Kikos were developed in New Zealand based on the needs of the local markets um, they wanted a meat goat and one that didn't require a lot of parasite control and certainly did not need hoof maintenance. Hoof maintenance is the, the biggest time consuming thing with, in my opinion, with goats. Uh, so taking the feral breed and crossing it with domestic breeds, they were able to develop a great meat goat that requires little to no maintenance. And that's our kind of animal. You know, we still have to sell the goat meat as we, you know, breed and get new animals, but we can keep the herd small so we can have uh, our pasture maintenance and we can have a little bit of meat to sell instead of just having the uh, cashmere fiber go to waste out in out in the field. And we really haven't managed our goats uh, nearly as well as the sheep. Um unauthorized breeding that is an ongoing problem with them they they get out they and um there seem to be goat kids popping out at the most inconvenient times and of course it makes the herd bigger when when we uh when we don't kind of take the time to get them to market and then you have these uh, other little kids coming along here and there and all of a sudden you've got a lot more goats than you really want and unlike the Kiko goat, which was developed for efficient meat production, the cashmere goats take a long time to get to a good size for market. Um, they're really they're bred for their winter undercoat of cashmere and with no regard for any other trait. So we're trading them out for the Kikos. Eventually, that'll take a, it'll take a little while to get there with that. And as I mentioned, we haven't discussed the donkeys and whether we will continue to keep them after the sheep are gone. They were purchased as livestock guardian animals for the sheep and um, they are also the only thing on the homestead that could be considered uh, a pet. <laughs> They're very friendly animals and they crave human interaction. Um, yeah, likely we'll keep at least a couple of them around and we want you guys to come and visit us and, and I wouldn't want you to miss them and I would miss them too. All right, finally, I get to the cows, and uh, this is actually going to lead into today's topic. In fact, I'll just skip right to the topic, um, and there won't really be any updates on it because I'm just going to talk about the cows. Um, the, uh, as far as updates, they're all doing really well. We're, we're milking two. We're milking butter, and we're milking violet. Um, so Normandy versus Jersey cows. Um kind of a cost analysis. Now, first, a short review of our choice for the Normandy breed of cows. And then second, how did we end up with the Jersey cow and the heifer calf? And lastly, how has this experience changed the way we think about our herd? All right, so why did we choose Normandy cows? I know you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. I love our Normandy cows. And for more particulars about the breed, listen to my podcast, Why Normandy Cows? Uh, we bought our first girls in the fall of 2011, and there was never any doubt in my mind that I would have a milk cow on our homestead. 
um, making cheese, butter, and yogurt, along with that luscious fresh milk straight from the cow, was on the top of my list of things I wanted in my life. Now, we had plenty of time to research what kind of cow we wanted to have for our traditional family cow. And as mentioned above, there are always uh, offspring to deal with when raising animals. So in order for a cow to produce milk, she needs to have a calf every year. She will produce milk for about a year before naturally drying up. But uh, proper management requires us to stop milking her and dry her off a good three months before she gives birth again. And that gives her the resources she needs to remain healthy and grow a healthy calf. So what kind of cow was going to give us a good calf for beef, as well as produce a lot of milk for my enjoyment and cheese making and so on? Well, we looked at dual breed cows. And there are quite a few breeds that are listed as dual breed, meaning they produce lots of milk, but also produce calves that grow out with well-marbled meat in a timely manner, uh, like a beef cow would. Another requirement we had was a good, um, healthy steer that could thrive on pasture and did not need to be grain finished to reach that well-marbled meat in a timely manner goal. And uh, same for the milk. She needs to be able to maintain her weight and condition without being fed the customary six pounds of grain a day allowed for organic grass-fed dairies. Uh, so they allow for to be organic grass-fed, they allow six pounds of grain per day. Commercial dairies will feed their cows up to 30 pounds of grain a day. Now, the trade-off with not feeding grain is less milk. Grain definitely increases milk production. And while I'm not opposed to feeding the six pounds of non-GMO, non-soy feed, if we need more production, um, right now our current model does not require this. And um, so let me explain a little bit more. My first concern is the health of the cow. I've seen some pretty skinny milk cows. Uh, milk cows in general want single purpose milk cows in general are very skinny cows. Um, and I've seen some that were being pasture raised with absolutely no grain and it's a fine goal. But if your cow is starving because so much of her energy is going into milk production that there's little left for her own needs, the goal is flawed. So I prefer more of a systems approach instead of the goal of having a lot of milk um, and, be, and all being grass fed. My system is designed to keep a healthy herd, to produce enough milk for us to make our traditional handmade artisan cheese in sufficient quantity support, to support the homestead and to produce excellent beef breeding and replacement stock with the annual calving. So that's my system. Um, and there are several breeds that advertise themselves as fitting those requirements. But the Normandy stood out in my mind. Um, their milk production is on par with the Jersey. The fat and protein components are on par with the Jersey. And the largest deciding factor was the composition of the milk as it relates to cheese making. And I'll get to that just a little bit later. It's the kappa casein protein that makes the difference there. So the Normandy cow uh, produces a milk with the protein, the kappa casein, BB kappa casein protein structure that is most conducive to cheese making. And in France, Normandy milk is prized and even required for some cheeses to carry a specific name. Camembert de Normandy comes to mind. Neufchatel is also made with milk from Normandy cows. Today's recipe uses Neufchatel cheese. It's, traditional, it's a traditional soft white table cheese, and it originated from the village of Neuchatel en Bray in northern Normandy. It's one of France's oldest cheeses, dating back as far as 1035. And often it's heart shaped. Um, now, that shape came about during the Hundred Years' War between England and France from 1337 to 1453. And tales are told about 
the French farm girls falling in love with English soldiers and making these heart-shaped cheeses to show their love. Um, in the U.S., they're just little rectangular blocks. And they're also made with pasteurized milk, so it's not quite the same product. But that is the Neuf Chatel. Um, now, one other characteristic we considered with our cows that we wanted was docility. Uh, cows are very large animals and compared to goats or sheep. And I wanted a breed that was gentle and easy to work with. And the Normandy has exceeded my expectations in that area. Far exceeded my expectations. So we love our Normandies. How did we come to own a couple of jerseys? And I often refer to Jersey cows when I'm talking about the Normandy and other dairy breeds. It's the most popular choice for a family milk cow. Typically, they produce lots and lots of milk with higher butter fat and protein levels than other breeds. Um, as I said, though, the Normandy is on par with them. There are several other breeds that kind of are equal with the butter fat and protein, but um, I'm not sure exactly why the Jersey is the favored one. Anyway. They are not a dual breed. Uh, they are actually quite skinny in their natural state, as are many single dairy cows. They're bony, in fact. Um, so while you look at our Normandies, and they'll be flat across their rump with meat and fat, the Jersey cow's hip bones are really prominent. Um, it's just how they're genetically built. Their energy primarily goes into making milk, not meat and uh, muscle fat. Um, so Jersey milk is highly prized for having the highest butter fat content. Uh, and that means you can make lots of butter. Cheese made from Jersey milk will also be higher in fat. And that means more flavor. You know, they are a great milk cow, but again, not a dual breed though. I do see a lot of marketing going on right now for Jersey beef. And I assure you that it is, um, is only marketing it's it's uh, marketing conducted using research obtained by the American Jersey Cattle Association so they're 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 literally trying to develop a market for Jersey beef because the uh, uh, Jersey bull calves are are just like completely useless because they don't they don't grow out well so they're figuring out how to do it they're conducting the studies that they're conducting with growing out these Jersey steers for beef, they include the standard grain diet fed to beef cattle. Um, they're simply not going to get the proper level of fat on grass only. And I, I don't know, I think it might actually work for the commercial market. I mean, if you throw enough grain at something, yeah, they can, they could put on some uh, muscle and fat. It wouldn't be viable for the family homestead though. I mean, I'm willing to change my mind if I'm wrong right now. My mind says that jerseys are not a dual breed. So again, how did we end up with a bred Jersey cow? We needed some cash flow and herd shares were one way to provide it. Um, and uh, a combination of the A2A2 certification of this particular cow and her calf also has the same genetics. Um, along with the possibility of an existing customer base, kind of tipped the scale. So when I was first approached, I simply wasn't interested in another cow and a jersey to boot. But the idea of offering herd shares was intriguing. And after a few days and lots of discussion, Scott and I decided to give it a try. It was a, a big financial risk, but we decided to take the plunge. The current offer what current current owner was offering her shares and uh, some of and she was going to stop and some of her customers would likely come to us after she stopped offering the service and so that would help offset the initial cost of the cow um, and that has worked out fairly well additionally I felt I could work it into my already busy marketing schedule as the herd shares contributed to our cheese centerpiece. Yes, we offer the fresh raw milk, but we also provide cheese, yogurt, and butter to our herd share owners. Uh, fast forward, butter has her calf, a very beautiful deer-like heifer. 
She's very bony and much smaller than our Normandy calves. Um, that's just how they come. They're just bony. And you see her standing next to those uh, two bull calves, which are just bulky, you know, just bulky, muscular. Uh, anyway, we started milking butter and offering fresh A2A2 milk via our herd shares. And the legal contracts are worded to include cheese, butter, yogurt, and cream as part of the herd production. Uh, so that's our herd share. And the A2A2 milk is the real draw for both the milk and the cheese. And we are actually in the process of getting our Normandy cows tested for the A2A2 beta casein genetic trait. Uh, for more on all about the A2A2 genetic trait, go and listen to my podcast, What is A2A2 Milk? Um, uh, there's a link in the show notes. But anyway, we're moving our her genetics to 100% A2A2 beta casein and BB kappa casein. That's the one for cheese. All right. So people who drink milk want the A2A2 beta casein. And when we're making cheese, we want the BB kappa casein. So those are just genetic traits that we're breeding for. I know I haven't talked about the kappa casein really, um, but uh, that probably needs its own podcast. Okay, so here's what we found out. The bad news. We'll go with the bad news first. First, the docility factor. Uh, Jerseys, and indeed most dairy cows, are fairly placid. Uh, What I see is that they are placid with humans. The Jersey cows are very aggressive with the other cows. Even Egwene, Butter's calf, is aggressive with her bottle. She pushes and jerks on that bottle with ferocity. More than, more than, I mean, the other boys do as well. But man, she is just off the scale with it. Um, And it's not a problem for us at all. Just noted, as I said, um, the Jersey cows are very placid with humans. Though the bulls have a really bad reputation. But our, our bulls are almost like pets. They're just really docile. All right, so that was the first thing, first bit of bad news. Now, second, that Jersey does produce some really good milk and cream. She also requires feed, expensive feed. While our Normandy cows stay fat and healthy on pure grass, even when they're in milk, a Jersey requires feed to maintain body condition when in milk. Um... We feed a little bit of supplement to our Normandies purely to keep them interested in coming into the milking parlor. Um, Violet, in particular, is quite fat, and uh, she never received any grain supplement until this year when we trained her to put her head into the milking stanchion. Um, I guess she did get a little bit, but not like every day like, like the others. We're getting just a little bit every day. Um, but the Normandy breed has been developed over centuries to thrive on a grass-based diet. And because we keep butter's milk separate, so our herd share owners can have 100% A2A2 milk, right? So we're able to keep track of which cow is giving how much milk because we, we keep her milk separate. We use that in our herd shares and the results are in, um, butter is getting about four pounds or so of non-GMO, non-soy dairy feed supplement. Um, Her milking parlor mate, who is Violet, gets about two handfuls of sweet feed. Violet produces as much or more milk than butter. That's right, as much and sometimes more milk from Violet without the expense of lots of special feed. And I I believe that butter is quite capable of producing quite a bit more milk than Violet. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it would depend on how much feed we gave to to Violet. We don't give her very much. Um, However, we would have to feed butter more grain, expensive grain, to accomplish it. Um, And we really don't need a lot of milk at this time. The herd shares are still building, and I'm only making cheese intermittently due to limitations of aging space. So we simply don't need the extra milk. So as long as they maintain their condition, give us a little bit of milk. Um, I'm just making note that it takes feed and money to keep that Jersey cow going. And it doesn't take that to keep the Normandy cow going. 
Now, if you run a Jersey dairy, it's probably worth the cost to have more milk. But for us, why spend the money if you don't have to? Um, if we wanted more milk production from our Normandies, we could feed them a dairy supplement. Who knows how much milk they would produce? I don't know. I, you know, I do know that the little bit of feed they do get increases their milk production significantly. Even just that little bit. And perhaps sometime in the future, that will be the way to go. You know, as our beet cheese business takes off, we may want to make more cheese than the original plan outlined. Um, we may have more herd shares available in the future. In that case, we may feed some grain to produce more milk. But for right now, the grass requires no cash flow. It's free. Now, you do have to pay for the hay during the winter. So fewer cows is the better option to produce more milk during milking and then not have to feed so much hay during the winter. All right, so where are we going to go from here? Um, the bottom line is we're going to phase out the jerseys. As soon as I can get at least one of my Normandy cows certified as having A2A2 genetics, butter goes up for sale. Um, we're already talking about selling her calf, a Gwaine. Uh, perhaps we will wait until we can sell her as a bred heifer. Well, I don't know. We'll see. In the end, the Normandy ladies rule. That's it. We'll be phasing out those jerseys. We love our Normandies. <laughs> All right, let's move on to this great recipe. Skillet chicken with Nuff to Tell spinach, uh, spinach artichoke sauce. You just can't go wrong with skillet chicken and a good cheese sauce. Perfectly golden brown, tender, pan-seared chicken breasts are topped with an easy-to-make, rich, and flavorful spinach artichoke sauce. Now, this sauce might remind you of my crab and artichoke artichoke dip but it's going to be much lighter it's a sauce not a dip i got a recipe link in the notes for that uh crab and artichoke dip if you're interested in that you can use enough to tell in that as, as well although it i think it calls for cream cheese but you could use enough to tell uh in place of the cr cream cheese all right what do we need for this recipe we need 24 ounces of boneless skinless chicken breast some salt and pepper uh four tablespoons of butter divided and three cloves of garlic a tablespoon of flour Three and a half cups of fresh baby spinach chopped and a can of artichoke quarters and drained and chopped. One and a quarter cups of milk. Four ounces of Nook to Tell cheese diced into small cubes and a third of a cup of finely shredded Parmesan cheese. And a quarter cup of sour cream. A lot of milk and cream in this really buttery, richy, creamy sauce. All right, you want to pound your uh, boneless chicken uh, breasts into an even thickness just use the flat side of a meat mallet uh, and then so that they're the same even thickness you want that so they they cook evenly season both sides with the salt and pepper you're going to heat two tablespoons of the butter in a large skillet and over medium high heat then you're going to uh, add the chicken cook it till it's golden brown on the bottom about five minutes rotate it to the opposite side continue cooking until the uh, chicken is golden brown on the bottom or you can use a, a thermometer and the center would read 165. So it's about five minutes longer. So five minutes on one side, five minutes on the other side. Transfer the chicken to a plate, cover, and keep it warm. And then you're going to melt the re remaining two tablespoons of butter in a skillet over medium heat again. Add the garlic and flour. Cook 30 seconds and then... Um, Add the spinach and artichokes and saute those for about a minute until the, the spinach has wilted. And then you're going to pour in the milk and scrape up, scrape up the brown bits from the bottom. And this is going to make the initially make the sauce. Then add in the Nuff to Tell cheese. It's going to melt. Add the Parmesan. Put some salt and pepper in there. And you're just stirring that until the mixture has thickened slightly and the cheese has melted. And then you're going to stir in the sour cream and put the chicken back into the skillet. It's quick and easy. That's it. That recipe serves four. Give yourself 15 minutes to prep the ingredients and about 18 minutes for cooking. In just 33 minutes, you've created a masterpiece. Final thoughts. Uh, we gave the Jersey breed a chance and ended up back in the same place we started. Normandy is the breed for us. I hope you get a chance to visit the farm sometime in the near future. See these beautiful creatures close up and personal. And you'll want to pet the donkeys as well. 
Um, we love the homestead life. There's always something new coming along. The variety and number of animals may uh, change according to our needs, but they will always be a central part of our life, especially the milk cows. Milk cows are such peaceful creatures. And our traditional breed Normandies exemplify peace. Again, Neuf de Tel cheese originated in Normandy, France, where our cows are from. It's a fantastic cheese, and even though the U.S. version of it is a bit watered down and rectac- rectangular rather than heart-shaped, um, give that skillet uh, chicken with the spinach artichoke sauce a try, and you'll be glad you did. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, give me a five-star rating and review. Also, the best thing you can do, share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. Please share on all your social media. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.